Okay, so now that we've defined complex systems, emergence of feedbacks, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about some other terms that we're often going to throw around during this course and use to describe especially some of the advantages of agent-based modeling and why you might want to use it over other methods or in complement to other methods. Um, so agent-based modeling is often very good at understanding leverage points, and we've already seen this um, in the FIRE model that we talked about earlier. So leverage points are places where a complex system can potentially be shifted from one regime to another with a minimal amount of, other, uh, amount of effort. Um, in other words, they're places where if I just tweak a little bit what's going on, I get a lot of bang for my buck. I get a lot of potential result in the outcome, right? And in the fire model, we saw this when we modified the, um, the amount of density in the system uh, of the trees by just a little bit. We went from a system, a system where the fire died out really easily to a system where it spread throughout the entire forest, right? And of course, that's also related to the notion of tipping points, which we talked about in the segregation model, right? Which are places where a small change in an input can dramatically affect the outcome. And in particular, in the, in the tipping point model, it was the fact that you had a small change in the diversity of a neighborhood that dramatically affected uh, the segregation of that neighborhood. Um, and, you know, this, this kind of brings us to a point, right? A lot of times what you want to do is you want to identify places where small changes in the outcome can dramatically affect what's going on or small changes in the input can dramatically affect what's going on. And, you know, uh, one of my colleagues, Scott Page, used to often say that complex systems analysis often gives you the most when it tells you the least. And the reason why he said that was because of the fact that if the system is showing you that there's many different ways the system can go, right, then you know that if I input just a small amount in one direction or another, I can really use that to lever the system the way I want, right? Um, and so actually huge was talking about this in the context of a project that we worked on together uh, called uh, Project Sluice, where we're looking at trying to influence suburban development. And one of the examples was that if, for instance, you build a model of suburban development and you see that when uh, cities develop, um, they can either develop to the north or to the south, and to the north there's an ecological area, and it, the model showed it's just as likely to happen either way, then maybe you can provide some incentives to cause the city to develop to the south in order to prevent the, the, the harm to the ecological area, right? Um, and that's related to this notion of path dependence, right? And path dependence is the idea that the current possibilities are limited by the past choices. So once you've encouraged people to develop to the south, then it's much less likely that you're going to see development to the north because urban development is a path dependent process. It's a process where people like to build near where people have built before. Right. And in fact, in this uh, project, we looked at uh, modeling of suburban sprawl in southeastern Michigan. This is work with Scott Page and Dan Brown and others. Uh, where we examined uh, how different patterns of development might occur. And one of the things that we like to look at was what parts uh, of the system were really path dependent, what parts of these systems were almost inevitable. And so what we did was we took a model of development and we classified it into what we called variant and invariant regions. And invariant regions were regions where no matter what you did, the system was going to develop the way it was. And invariant regions were systems where there was some control over the system, right? So in this particular case, all of these um, blank white areas are places where the model predicts they will never be developed no matter how, this, how the, the path of development occurs. The dark uh, blacker areas are places where development will always occur, and the gray areas are the places where someone might actually have control over the development of the system. Now, related to path dependence is the notion of sensitivity to initial conditions. Um, so a, a sensitivity to initial conditions actually really has two kind of ways it's often used. And I call one the, the strong condition, one the weak condition. And in the strong condition, this is actually the, the way we often talk about it, or this is the way it is talked about in, the, in chaos theory. Um, and in fact, sensitivity to initial conditions in this form is a condition of chaos theory, which says that every starting point is arbitrarily close to another starting point with a significantly different future. And it was Lorenz who really defined that in 1972. 
Um, and uh, what he was saying was that if I choose two points, even if they're arbitrarily close to each other, they may wind up at very different places after the system is done running, right? And he generated as part of that this famous Lorenz curve, which kind of illustrates that point that you can choose these very close points um, that wind up very different from it. And in Lorenz's case, it was found out that there, when he tried to restart a model he had been running before, it wound up in a different place because he didn't have the same resolution on the input values that he had when he was running the model. Uh, Lorenz kind of paraphrased this to say that chaos is when the present determines the future, but the approximate present does not approximately determine the future, right? Uh, in other words, we don't really know if we're close to the initial conditions, whether or not we're going to get an accurate prediction at all. Um, this is also sometimes called the butterfly effect. Um, the idea being that if a bird flaps its wings in um, China, that may cause it to rain versus not rain or a tornado to form over uh, Texas, right? Um, and because the, the small perturbations in that system can dramatically affect the outcome. The weak version of all of this is uh, often what we apply in agent-based modeling. Uh, and I'd say the weak version of sensitivity to initial condition is the idea that just where you start matters significantly, right? Uh, and so uh, we won't make this strong claim that it's this arbitrary close distance, but rather that the initial conditions of the model often uh, have a large impact on, on the outcome. And a lot of agent-based models feature that. A lot of agent-based models aren't chaotic in the pure sense of the term, but they do feature a weak sensitivity to initial conditions. Of course, part of the reason why they feature that is because of nonlinearity within the systems. Um, the idea of nonlinearity is that the inputs are not linearly related to the outputs. In other words, if I modify one input just a little bit, it doesn't, make, it doesn't necessarily mean that the output just modifies a little bit. It can happen in nonlinear ways, in big jumps and leaps. Uh, and the example I have here is of the giant component model, which is another model in the NetLogo models library. And the reason why I illustrate this is that as you change the number of connections per node within the system by just a little bit, you suddenly see the formation of this giant component within the network. It goes from a system with very detached nodes all over the place to a system in which there's really one big component that contains the vast majority of nodes within the, within the model. Somewhat opposite notion that sometimes appears in agent-based modeling, it's important to understand, is the notion of robustness. So robustness is when a system maintains its characteristic behavior even after you've perturbed an input uh, to that model. And the NetLogo segregation model, or sorry, the sorry, Tom Schelling segregation model implemented in NetLogo that we explored is a great example of this, right? Um, so even if you change the inputs to um, the, uh, the, in terms of the, percentage of neighbors like yourself you need to have in order to be happy, um, the model still winds up in a segregated state uh, and it's robust to changes in that parameter. Of course, a lot of models feature diversity and heterogeneity. Um, often we want to model diverse and heter heterogeneous systems. And um, you know, there's an entire set of literature on this topic that I, I point you in the direction of uh, where people looked at the relationship between diversity and complex systems, most notably some of the work by Scott Page. So most traditional modeling approaches fail to accurately capture the heterogeneity of all individuals. Nature-based modeling allows us to do that. And I'll talk about two quick models that can help you explore this. One is um, a honeybee model. And in this particular case, the problem is the honeybees need to regulate the temperature of their hives. And they do that by fanning their wings, right? So if the hive gets too hot, they fan their wings to cool it off. And if the hive gets uh, too, and that way they can regulate the temperature, right? Now, if all honeybees start fanning at the exact same time, what you would get is you would get kind of these dramatic oscillations of the temperature of the system. Instead, what nature has built into these honeybees is some diversity of their um, thresholds to when they start fanning, right? As a result of that, you get smooth transitions in and out of two hot systems. And so as a result, they're able to maintain the temperature of the hive at a fairly constant rate rather than having the temperature oscillate quite a bit. 
Another example of this is the standing ovation problem, right? And then the standing ovation problem, the idea is how do people deter decide when to stand to applaud a, um, a, a particular performance, right? Now, if everyone um, made their decision just based upon some quality signal of the performance and we all have the same quality threshold, right, then you probably would not see very many standing ovations. But we actually see quite a few standing ovations. So why is that? Um, so one theory is that maybe some people have a lower threshold to stand than others and the other people have a higher threshold, but that threshold can be lowered uh, by the fact that they see other people around them standing. In other words, they've been to a social pressure. So if that's the case, then you would expect to see more uh, standing ovations than you do if everyone has the same exact threshold. And in fact, that's what we seem to see and some nice models show that that's the case. And part of the reason why that's the case is because people are socially influenced by each other and interconnectedness and interactions is an important part of what agent-based modeling tries to understand. Um, in this case, I'm looking at uh, Twitter retweet networks. And so this is for um, the Osama bin Laden capture and death. This is for Hurricane Sandy. Uh, and this is for the US 2012 presidential election. And in each of these cases, by understanding the interconnectedness between individuals and how they found out about these different events, or at least read about them on Twitter, uh, we can better understand the diffusion of information through the network and hopefully build models to help us uh, understand how that system works. So now I've kind of laid out a couple of key terms. And from this, we're going to go on to start exploring how those key terms and what those concepts mean in terms of when you want to use agent-based modeling and why you might want to use it. Thanks.